Thank you very much for the invitation and for the introduction. Uh, what I would like to do today is to argue that maybe we need to do what we did with uh, information theory, transforming and broadening it to something bigger, scientific information. So I will talk a little bit about this. And actually by this, I will try to, uh, try to convince you that we need maybe scientific information. These are my collaborators. I will thank them at the end of the talk. Let's go to the talk. So we all recognize that AI is reshaping technology. I'm not sure we're also recognizing that there are some limitations, predicament, for wider use in many other applications. Let me give you a few examples. In medicine, doctors will not use AI unless they can explain the inference. Uh, autonomous, autonomous cars and other systems, uh, they, we need to understand better how to verify and secure this system. Uh, in social application, let's say prison sentencing, automatic prison sentencing, we have to understand better a very subtle issue of fairness. I will talk a little bit about it later. And corporation, in order for them to actually use it, uh, even more AI, we need to address privacy, security, and other issue that I will not talk too much today, but you will see that it will go through, we will, we will touch it throughout the talk. So these are the challenges and we need methodology and uh, models that address them in very broad sense, all kinds of optimality in AI from system optimality, data optimality, to model optimality. We want to make sure that the model or the system is sufficiently rich to support our inference and it's sufficiently trained. I mentioned robustness also, stability. We want to make sure that small changes in the parameter do not change too much the outcome. So we will talk about this more details in, the, in this talk. Let me start by saying, okay, if we agree that maybe we need to broaden AI to science of AI foundation, we have to base it on some pillars. I would say data, information, complexity, logic, and inference. And I will touch each of this issue a little bit. I would like to say that for me, AI, like many other systems, are kind of a triad from data to information to knowledge. I'm coming from information, so I will focus on information. And, but it is not original Shannon information, but something bigger, we call it science of information. And in fact, information is not entropy. Information is a matter of distinguishability. So Shannon, for Shannon, it was distinguishability between signal and noise. Noise in our world uh, is much more complicated, including human noise. So this is something that we need to actually look at it. Knowledge is something much more complicated and subtle. I will look at it as the information and action and application. So let's, let's move to the next slide. Okay, it doesn't want to move just a second. Okay. Uh, uh, I cannot move the slide for some reason. Okay. Okay. Sorry for this. So I will I will focus on the heart of this triad: information, science, and information. And here, what I want to say: Shannon in forty A gave us beautiful theory of uh, information theory. It started with three fundamental papers where he asked the question, what is the lower bound for compression and how much signal I can send over a noisy channel? But information is too, uh, we cannot leave it to information theory because nowadays information is much different for, it's created, organized, uh, abstracted, infer, value, secure, and so on. So 10 years ago, we decided actually to, con and we convinced NSF, uh, and we got the one of the first science and technology center, and the goal was to advance science and technology of better understanding and representation of information in all kinds of applications from biological, physical to social. We actually focus on four aspects. 
temporal, structural, partial, and semantic information. These were pretty much neglected at that time in, info, in information theory. And uh, I, will I will actually start this talk with an example that it could be either information uh, or AI and show you how structural and temporal information can work together. So let me first say a little more about science of information, science of AI. There are some aspects of each of this uh, element of this triad. So in data, we can ask whether it's classical or quantum. I talk a little bit about it, how to sample it. Information, where I focus my talk, will be about modeling, optimality, noise. As I say, noises might be, have different form. Knowledge part is the hardest and the most subtle. We need to understand fairness, privacy, trust. Without this, it will be difficult to answer our question. Now, there is a difference between science information and science of AI. Information theory created by Shannon actually gave us foundation, and we use it to actually produce, to start actually a digital area. And then practice actually told us we have to go to theory and actually broadening it, which is science of information. In AI, as I understand, actually we started with incredible application and we are trying to catch up. And that is part of the talk that I say, maybe we should look at this more carefully. So to explain to you what I mean, I have to go to something that I understand well and actually show you one problem that we solve, which could be AI problem as well and as, as uh, uh, science of information. I will go to dynamic networks. This is the brain that we see connection between different functions in the brain that we see today. The question would be, this is dynamic network because evolution was adding function to it. And the question is, can we do inverse engineering and to see which are the oldest part of the brain? And what are the youngest? Based on this structure that I show you. And here you have a protein-protein network, the same question, what is the oldest protein? These are artificial uh, dynamic networks, uh, internet or Facebook. By dynamic network, it means the nodes are added and deleted. Okay, so what, let me start with, uh, so there are several up other applications. Uh, okay, I think, let me make sure that. Okay, so uh, to explain the model, actually, I will, I, I had a cartoon that is very accurate for nowadays. Let us show in a small town, a virus came and, uh, and it infected people. So people go to a hospital. They are lining in a hospital, the hospital trying to figure out who infected whom, so they created a graph, a structure of the graph, and from this graph they were trying to, they see a snapshot of the graph, they don't know where it started, and they are trying to do inverse engineering and to figure out what is the first node that was added or the first person that was infected, okay? so. A lot of other applications from social network to uh, infection disease that I show you to financial transaction to protein protein network. Actually, we know that ancient protein, proteins might be implicated in some kind of a cancer. Okay, so here what I want to do today with you as an example. Let's, uh, let's assume that we got, and actually we got some MFRI data for a healthy brain. And we identify some function, let's say 50 of that, and we create a graph of connection. So what, the, what, do you, what do I mean by this? For example, when you walk, you have to breathe. So these two functions have to be, uh, uh, work together, but you don't need to think. And uh, so, this, so this is a snapshot of a graph that we see of connection between different functionality. Can I do inverse engineering and tell you that this part of the brand is older than this one? So this is a motivating example. And the next thing, and I need to, I want to underline that is we need to do another, especially in AI also, we have to have a mathematical formulation. So here what we do. So let us assume that I have nodes up to N of them. And then the oldest node is the number one. 
And let me show you one example how such a graph can be created. Each node that arrives at three connection to the existing node. But actually, it does in a special way. It connects to the more likely to the node with higher degree than to lower degree. This is called preferential attachment, as you know. And this is an example of a graph that I'm going to use throughout this. The only problem is that nobody actually gives me the level. What I see is, let's say, a, a genie or a devil comes and actually permutes all of these nodes. And what I see, I see on, on the right hand side. The structure is the same, but I don't know the levels. I don't know which node was the first, what was the last. What the question is, based on this uh, permuted graph with levels, can I recover the original structure? The problem is difficult. So I'm looking for node arrival in dynamic networks. The problem is difficult because first, for every pair of a node, so it is n choose two n square node pairs, I have to decide which, which node arrived first in this pair. I have to guess n square over two, n choose two uh, 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 arrival. The answer is, and this is, by the way, saved by a lot of time. The answer is you cannot recover exact node of arrival. Probability of not recovering is close to one. The number of errors that I will make is about n squared. And so this is not the right problem. What we can do? Let's look. Sometimes, actually, I don't need to know all of the exact order. What I can do? I can group the nodes, let's say no, node number one and two. I want to make sure that they are they are arriving before, before node number four and three. So within a group, within a bin, what we call, we do not make any order and we don't know the order. But between bins, between groups, we would like to discover the order. So the question is, can I solve this problem? and what the optimal solution looks and what is a good application for this. So that's what we're going to do. But how we can actually, what is the performance of such a network? How we can measure whether our solution is good or not? Okay, we need two notions, precision and density. Now, if you look, if I make only one big bin and put all items there, there is no problem. The problem disappears, but it's not interesting anymore because I don't want to have orders within a, a, a bin. So what I need, the density, I want to make sure that the number of bins is as big as possible. It means it should be close to n squared over two with an epsilon factor. So I want large density, but within this density, so this k, think about k about the number of bins. Within this density, I want to make sure that I make as many correct uh, uh, guesses between these beans, that beans bi arrived in before beans bj. So here what we need to do, the optimality here, what is the relation, optimal relation between density and precision? Here some mass comes, and so my problem formulation, I want to maximize precision uh, subject to density being bigger than some epsilon. We can do it. One way to do it is through nonlinear interior programming. XUV is, a, is basically is equal one if node U arrived because before node V. The, the, the probability that this happened, which is actually hard to compute sometimes, but uh, this is not the end of the formulation. This is maximization, which we can reduce to linear, but they are constrained. And the main constraint actually that we want that the number of beans is epsilon of the maximum number of beans. If we do it, the next question is how to compute this probability of uh, uh, node u arriving before new v. We actually have a lemma saying that we can, if we sample uniformly for all, uh, around all permutation, we're actually getting what we're supposed to get. This gives us a chance to actually, we noted that this is equivalent to producing linear extension of partial order, which was well studied. But what we use, we use Markov uh, Monte Carlo uh, 
algorithm to actually estimating p view and solving this problem uh, uh, numerically. Now, this will give me my best, uh, up with the best curve between precision and uh, density. But the next thing, before I show you the, the curve, I need to have an algorithm that actually I want to compare against this optimal curve. And algorithm that is uh, complexity, low, and so on. The peeling algorithm is what I would suggest to you. Uh, so here what I will do. Uh, let's look at the graph on the left. And I will look for all nodes that have the lowest degree. In this case, three. And there are node number six, 12, 11, and 10. I delete the nodes and all edges. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, okay. Uh, then I will find the node of the lowest degree, number nine, okay, nine, eight, and seven. Delete it, then another one, another one, another. This creates me a digger, uh, the directed isarchy graph. And I claim that the nodes uh, on the, the node in the bottom are the oldest, the next one, the, the next level, the next level, the next level, the next level. Okay, so the question I have in an algorithm how well uh, it is doing? Okay, so I have to compare to the optimal curve, the red curve is the optimal curve that I get theoretically. My peeling algorithm around here, blue point, I can improve it, which looks like it's pretty good. So now I'm a little confident that this might work. So the next thing that I need to do is to find a good application. This is the knowledge part, information action. So what we did, we actually, uh, got information, the data from a healthy brain. We created 46 nodes and we connected two nodes the Pearson coefficient between them is greater than 0.8. We apply our algorithm and here what we got. So this is the lowest, the oldest part of the brain. So this is bin one, bin two and so on. The question is how do you know that it is good? We don't know the truth, grand truth. We talk to biologists, they say, you, pretty, we have, you are pretty good. We know that this uh, colossum, uh, uh, corpus colossum is one of the oldest, but can we do some verification? Okay, so here what we did. We bought data for 400 healthy brains and we apply it for one particular area. Let's say uh, here is cortex, auditory cortex. And we want to see that our algorithm return, consecutive, uh, return consistently the same ranking. In fact, it is very well, at least here and here, it's quite well uh, uh, concentrated. So this is the only verification that we can have. And this could be used as a filter. So to summarize, we started with the problem formulation. We do mathematical formulation. We optimize it. And uh, we, uh, we got an algorithm that works well, and finally we get an application. So can we do something like this in our in AI system? So the one thing that I want to do recently, we start talking about uh, quantum data. Quantum data is everywhere. Actually, it's it, uh, what I just learned that the quantum methodology can be used to actually model brain behavior, which might be useful for misinformation. You can, I listed here many different applications. And here is the one that actually I would particularly try to solve. Okay, so let's assume that I have photon and let's say, or some quantum system, and I can have two different systems. I will system A or B. One will be entangled, the other will be separable. What does it mean? That means, so the system is described by, by density matrix. And tangle matrix means that I cannot the, 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 the partition these two states into a tensor product of zero, zero. Why separable state means that I can do this partition into different things. So what is my problem? I want to actually uh, uh, understand when the, the, let's say supervised learning, I train my system and I want to know when a, a new quantum system photon comes, can I predict whether it is entangled or not? That is the objective. 
based on some measurement. The problem, the problem is, okay, the problem is that we need to understand that in quantum situations that are non-cloning theorem, we cannot reuse data, so we have to be very careful. So there are different approaches to this. One is basically state tomography, which means to understand the quantum state and then try to do classification, but it's too expensive. We're gonna do something else. We're gonna do something that we call uh, UNTA measurement. So what we do, let's say the quantum system is in dimension 10. We base our decision on only two dimension, H2 and H6. H is the Hilbert space. Let me explain to you in different way. If I have a Boolean function over 10 variables, and you know the outcome could be zero and one, but I want to approximate this outcome based on not 10 variables, but let's say only the variable x2 and x6. So I'm reducing to two variables, I'm reducing the dimensionality of the problem, and the question is, can I find an optimal uh, solution in this case? In fact, we, uh, we uh, apply the Fourier approach, and let me show you the next slide. And here is a numerical example that you see K is here, the number of reduction of dimensionality from 10 to 3. We are getting the dimensionality, by the way, is 1045, 240, 64. You can see that with K equal 4, we are basically uh, uh, predicting with almost probability 1 the right state. This is artificial data made in MATLAB. We are working right now with physicists from University of Chicago and trying actually to help them with recognizing dark matter because it turns out that photon when it goes through dark matter has got polarized or not. And we are trying to see whether this can actually work there. We'll see. So uh, let me give you only a few insight into this. Uh, okay, I think I have about 10 more minutes, correct? Uh, so, what we did, we have, we have to label. The label is measurement, uh, uh, quantum measurements. We represent this measurement, it is an operator, as a uh, Fourier expansion of a poly operator, sigma is poly operator. We assume that this Fourier is well concentrated. And then we created an algorithm that here at the end is the measurement predictor that it depends on this function f for which we estimated coefficient of the Fourier fs. We can do it based on the data that we get, so supervised learning. Once we have a predictor, good predictor of this operative level operators, we can actually produce through these two functions the operators at the end that when measurement, it gives us either zero or one. Now, in quantum, nothing is deterministic. So what we are getting, the output is also uh, 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 random, but this is okay. So uh, let me mention that the framework in which we did it is quantum pack. So basically with some loss function, so we predict and then nature reveals us the, uh, the real level and we're making some uh, loss, we incur some loss. And the loss in our case was misclassification probability. And what we can prove that our algorithm gives us the loss that is also only epsilon away from the optimal loss with very high probability. So, and our quantum algorithm basically, we give you a class of measurement. And this guy that was pi zero and pi y, and the, this algorithm chooses one of them and trying to do the best prediction. So this is quantum. Now, a little unusual, uh, it turns out that AI in agriculture is an interesting problem, and it is learning of SAS. It started from the fact that we start working on this, and my colleague, Alan Grama, actually, noticed the focus on provenance in food uh, supply chain. So let's say this is the food supply chain. We start sitting in the field, something is growing, a salad, let's say, we transport it for a supply chain and then it arrives to our home and we get poison. So we would like to understand, go backward and find from which field this poison part did come out. One of the technique that we could use is called microbial spores designed by our colleague in Harvard. So here, how it works more or less. 
So we have foot F or any subline part of the car, and we know that it comes from this subline nodes and the possible possible destination in the red part. So what's happened? Let's say we started here and this goes through this node supply chain and arrive at the destination. Here's the problem. Once I know, so here what I see, I know at this node that the destination node that something is wrong. I spread this, I mark some of the nodes, the red nodes, I know that it goes through this because I spray it with this micro uh, spore. And the question is, can I recover the path? Is it this path or is it this path or something else? So the formulation actually is like this. So we have a graph with a level B, which is mark node. We have a, for every foot item or whatever item you want, part of the car, there is a class of possible sources and class of possible destination. What we need to recover is a path in this graph that we might not know the structure, by the way, going from the source to destination. What is giving to us is only foot item. I know that I can't get poison because I had a Big Mac in McDonald's. And I, and I know that it happened in uh, West Lafayette, so I know the destination. I have to find the path. By the way, this problem is much more interesting because it's actually learning sets. And I understand there is no good theory yet for this. So we have to learn this set, knowing something about this. And by the way, the feature is that some nodes in the graph are marked. So some of the nodes are equal ones, others are zeros. The level we might formulate, okay, I want to know whether the particular path is actually most likely uh, uh, follow, or so it's a zero one levels. However, in much more general, we need much larger level because we need actually huge number of levels. So uh, maybe logistic regression with soft uh, max function is more accurate. We are working on this problem and actually we will formulate it at learning sets and we might have some result in, in few months. Okay, the next problem. Uh, I finally finished with something that we aspire to do. We don't know how to do it. We all know that we, it has to be done. Uh, in New York Times in, 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 I think two, three years ago, uh, gave us a list of 11 things that we really have to know. And one of them is how to deal with misinformation. I don't need to argue about this. Um, the problem with this is that one, we can patch some security problem in a computer, you can't patch human brains. And this is the big thing to understand. So let's start with a very informal, and there will be very argument, what we, how we can define misinformation. I, I needed to do the same with when I tried to understand information. So misinformation could be viewed as a set of facts that are not true. So we need logical sense. And it's very hard to verify computationally. A better definition for me at least is that a statement on a proposition, logical proposition is mis misinformation. If it accepts accept novelty, what I mean by this novelty is Let's say if you ask me whether the sun will rise tomorrow, you, I know that it will rise. So there is, it doesn't carry any information. I can make it more formal. I have a slide at the end of the talk if you want to hear about this more. And this is related to distinguishability. Remember I told you information is about distinguishability. So novelty, but the fact are false and contributes to a variable information. Example, that is a little probably complicated. Let's say the question is whether Tom Brokaw wants Brian Williams fired. What we do, we go on the internet, social network, we collect data. The problem is some of the data will support the statement, some not. It is not zero one logic. We will only can get with some probability whether this statement based on the fact that we found on the internet that whether we can support this statement or not so we need to go beyond uh, the binary logic and this is my last slide that i spent few seconds 
I believe this is a problem that requires a lot of different methodology. First of all, what is information, what is novelty? And again, novelty means that I can actually, that the message that arrives gives me some extra information and it contributes to distinguishability. Networking, do I have trusted uh, sources that provide the information. Once I get this one, what I would do, I will be the, uh, I will build the knowledge, knowledge based database, which is basically first order logic, which will uh, describe to me, for example, the question that I asked before. This is part of the mark of logic network, but from this knowledge database, which is again, first all the logic, I have to create Markov fields so I can ask the question, is this statement correct or not? The answer will be only with some probability. But that's not it, and that's the problem, because we need cognitive model, because humans, they evolve this. We need a good definition, what does it mean, trust. And at the end, we need some algorithm. All of this is part here of the general framework that we are trying to actually, we, we, we try to understand and build the network for misinformation. This mathematical model, but the biggest part, algorithmic part is here, reasoning engine. We come up with uh, something that we call per, per, uh, per, permutation or perturbation method. When we change one of the key elements in the knowledge base, how much our probability do change. Okay, I'm not sure, I think I'm on time. So I thank my collaborators, my friend Anand Grama, Philip Jacquet and Gilles Shamir from Google, and my postdoc at the end of the talk. <laughs>